Welcome to the Salvation Army South Windsor Citadel. Some words from Psalm 148 as we begin our time together. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights above. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his heavenly hosts. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, you highest heavens and you waters above the skies. Let them praise the name of the Lord, at, for at his command they were created, and he established them forever and ever. He issued a decree that will never pass away. Praise the Lord. Let us dedicate our morning of worship to the Lord. 
Heavenly Father, it is our privilege to unite our time and attention in giving you praise. We unite our voices with all of creation to declare your praise, your faithfulness throughout all generations. We pray, Father, that you would be honored and glorified through everything that is said and sung and done here this morning. We pray that you would open not just our ears but our hearts to receive what you would have us hear in this time together. In Jesus' name, amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Mark, specifically Mark chapter 5, verses 1 to 20. This is the word of the Lord. They went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, "'What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God?' In God's name, don't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, Come out of this man, you impure spirit. Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. A large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs, allow us to go into them. He gave them permission, and the impure spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. Those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and countryside. And the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there, dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man, and told about the pigs as well. Then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. Jesus did not let him, but said, Go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you 
and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And all the people were amazed. May God bless his word this morning. My name is Major Angela Hachitapika. In the Salvation Army, I'm the Territorial Secretary for Women's Ministries. The empowerment of women and girls in this territory begins with uh, belonging to the Salvation Army itself because in the Army, uh, women and girls take, take part, whether it's leading meetings in the church, whether it is playing in the band, uh, whether it is even territorial leadership. As a woman officer, well, I have an opportunity to be whatever I want to be. I've been able to do my master's degree in public health as a Salvation Army officer. I've traveled a lot. I've been able even to be a member of the Anti-Human Trafficking Task Force, the International Task Force. If I belong to another church, I would be told this is just for men. Most of the churches here uh, still have male dominance. Uh, women and girls are not allowed like to preach in the main service, but the army allows that. We have activities that empower the women and girls. So we would have topics where we educate women how to protect themselves uh, against cancer of the cervix. We do have topics also for entrepreneurship. We do village banking where women with completely no business will put small amounts of money each week and save and then when they've saved enough they will get that money and maybe a little more to start uh, a business for themselves or to help them with the school fees for the children. There's, no, no, there's nowhere else where a woman can get uh, money because most of the women have nothing. A major Pamela I'm the executive secretary uh, and also the literary secretary for the territory. I'm studying gender studies because I want to explore more on the, on the role that women play in the community. It's very important to integrate gender in the Salvation Army because looking at the ground, we, it's the women that are affected more than the men and uh, if you involve them in the Salvation Army, it will help them. It's important that women and girls' voices are heard. Can we find another way, you know, to survive and stand together and say no? These programs are important for women here. Women are just as good as men, but we know that even education previously, it favored men. It is also important for you and for me as a woman, for our own self-motivation, our own existence to know that I count in society in as much as we count before God.
Before we reflect further on God's word, let us just dedicate uh, these words to God. Heavenly Father, I give you thanks for your word. I give you thanks for the privilege of being your messenger. I just pray, Father, that the meditation of my heart would be pleasing to you this day. And once again, that you would open not just our ears, but our hearts to receive the message that you would have us hear and to respond as Holy Spirit would prompt us to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Scripture is filled with testimonies of people who were given a new beginning in life simply through an interaction with Jesus or encounter with Jesus. While Jesus doesn't physically walk among us today, we know that the new beginnings experienced in Scripture are still available to us today. As we reflect on a theme of new beginnings, we consider that from his very first moments on earth, an encounter with Jesus reclaimed the outcast. Now, I know it's not Advent or Christmas, but humor me for a moment and journey with me to the Nativity. If you want to follow along in your Bible, we're headed to Luke chapter 2, beginning around verse 8. Now, I must admit, aside from the star of Christmas, Jesus himself, I think my favorite people to focus on in the nativity are the shepherds. So as we journey to the fields outside of Bethlehem, I don't just want us to feel as observers to the scene. I want us to picture ourselves in the scene alongside the shepherds. We are out in the fields, keeping watch over our flocks at night. Now, a shepherd's job is not simply a 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. kind of job. There was no going home at the end of the day, showering, enjoying a hot meal, or refreshing drink after a day outdoors. No flopping on the comfy couch and tuning out to our favorite show on Netflix. As a shepherd, home is the outdoors, with the sheep. We live with the sheep in the fields. We care for the sheep day and night. As far as society is concerned, we might as well be stinky sheep ourselves. We are considered pretty low, if not among the lowest in the hierarchy of value placed on a person's life. While our sheep trust us wholeheartedly, society doesn't trust us at all. If they actually listen to what we have to say, our testimony is not considered reliable, and we would never be called on in a court of law because of that. So, now that we feel so encouraged by how valued we are in society, hear that it is to, to us, the shepherds, that the good news of great joy for all people is first proclaimed. It is a clear but dark night around Bethlehem. Our sheep are settling to sleep when all of a sudden it seems like the sunrise is coming all too soon. Except the sky is too dark for it to be morning. Suddenly, there are these beings in front of us, proclaiming good news of great joy for all people. We are told about this baby that we will find wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. After their proclamation, we are given the most amazing heavenly concert. And then our eyes try to readjust to the darkness around us once these bright beings have ascended back into heaven. While we may be a bit dismayed, we hear one shepherd speak up. Let's go. Pardon? Let's go. A display like that? News like that? Why wouldn't we go and see this thing that has happened? Well, as you may know, the shepherds do go. And they find the baby just as the angels had declared. But even more amazing than this discovery is the fact that after discovering Jesus, 
The shepherds were so excited by all that had happened that they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard were amazed. The shepherds, the unreliable, stinky sheep people, are given the greatest news the world needs to hear. And people actually heard what they had to declare. From his very first moments on earth, Jesus had something to say about the place of the outcast in society. An encounter with Jesus provided a new beginning for the outcast. Throughout his ministry, we see Jesus restore a number of individuals. And we could take several weeks just looking at those people who Jesus brought back in from the outside. This morning, the second place I want us to journey to is not a birthplace, but is instead a place of death, the place we reflected on from Mark's gospel in chapter 5. Jesus is much older now. His reputation has been spreading. And people are beginning to learn that there is something about this man named Jesus that makes things right. There's something about him that draws them near, many in hopes that he would have the life-changing impact on them that they have witnessed in so many others. As we cross the lake with Jesus and begin to get out of the boat and onto the shore, it doesn't take long for us to spot a wild man. His hair is matted. He's covered in dirt. He has open wounds from self-inflicted harm, as well as scars from what seem to be attempts to keep him bound in the past. There's a piece of us that wants to plug our noses and shield our eyes, but curiosity has a grip on us, and we cannot help but wonder how Jesus is going to react and interact with this man. The man comes running at Jesus. Should we get in his way? Push Jesus aside? Pick up sticks for self-defense? Approaching Jesus, he falls on his knees, and he begins to beg Jesus for mercy. How does this man even know who Jesus is? We've been traveling with Jesus for so long, and we don't recall ever seeing this man before. Jesus quickly recognizes that this man is possessed by an impure spirit, and he immediately calls the spirit to leave the man. The spirits inform Jesus that, in fact, there are many spirits within this man, and the spirits are fully aware of who Jesus is and the power that Jesus has. Jesus hears a little bit about of their plea for mercy, and he agrees to send them into that poor herd of pigs who then drown in the lake. Aside from ourselves, the only other witnesses to this event are those tending to the pigs, who immediately run into the town and countryside and share all that they have witnessed. I'm not sure that the people were pleased with Jesus, especially those who owned the thousands of pigs now drowned. But they all came to see Jesus. And upon their approach, we can see the shock and disbelief on their faces. Who is that man sitting at Jesus' feet? He looks like that maniac who's been living among the tombs. But how can it be? He's clothed. He's quiet. He still desperately needs a bath, but clearly he is not the same person that they had been familiar with. Now, we could look deeply at this story in itself, but for today we are really interested in the transformation that takes place for the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons. Witnessing and hearing all they did, the town and country folk beg Jesus to leave. Their reaction is one of fear, and it would take them time to figure out all they had just witnessed and all that had just happened. Jesus doesn't plead with them to let him stay, 
But he heads for the boat. The disciples prepare to push away from the shore, but they hear, wait, wait, take me with you, please. I've been alone all these years. You've given me this newfound freedom, clarity of mind. Please let me stay near you. It was the man who had been demon possessed. Jesus instructs the man to go home to his own people. Tell them how much the Lord has done and the mercy that he has had on him. The man does as Jesus said, and once again, all the people were amazed. Once again, we see that someone previously cast out by society, ignored, left to his own devices, someone not likely heard before, is sent away with a testimony and instructed to share what has happened to him. Now, if people had seen this man running into town before, they likely would have ran inside and locked their doors. They would have gotten out of the way, likely for fear of what this man could have been capable of doing. But this time, as, the man, uh, as this man runs into town, the people don't hide away. They stay long enough to hear what this man seems to be shouting about today. And as they hear, they see. The man speaks of transformation. We can see the transformation. The man speaks of a new beginning and Jesus. And the look on people's faces around town tells us that not only are they hearing what this man is saying, but they are amazed because they are seeing for themselves the results of what he is sharing. For once, he's not talking nonsense, even if they cannot understand all that he is speaking about. Once again, an encounter with Jesus brings the individual once cast out back into community. As I reflected on this, the shepherds and the man who had been possessed, and as I reflected on their engagement with society, I thought that not only was this a new beginning for the outcast, but in a sense it was also a new beginning for those who considered themselves on the inside. Perhaps the religious elite, those responsible for upholding and teaching the law. They had been diligent about keeping the clean and the unclean apart. And now this Jesus guy comes in and he's mixing it all up. Those unclean are now seeking reintegration. Those unclean are now speaking a message worth hearing. For those who had the ability to hear what was being spoken, the message was amazing. As I reflect on this notion of insiders and outsiders, I easily identify that while society is trying to make a place of belonging for everyone on the inside, there are still many in society considered outcasts, people who don't belong. Could society look at the church and say that the church itself behaves and sometimes sends a message as though this is a place for everyone except fill in the blank? Has the church forgotten or gotten away from the all-inclusive come-as-you-are message and started to fall back into a habit of religious elites? Are we, on the inside, spreading an invitation to come far and wide? Or have we taken it upon ourselves to invite only those we feel comfortable interacting with? There is wording in the Officer's Covenant that I struggled with for a little bit. It was wording that says, I will love the unlovable. Now, I don't find that commitment difficult. What I struggled with was believing that there could be such a person who would fit this definition of being 
unlovable. My heart hurts for the people that fall into the category of being unlovable. Fortunately, I don't actually consider anybody unlovable. And yet, unfortunately, I have witnessed how terrible people can be to other people. Our society behaves as though there are people in this category. And while all of us tuning in today are not officers, and you're not called perhaps to that same covenant with that line of loving the unlovable, Jesus calls us as his body, as his followers, to love unconditionally. He calls us to share the message that through Jesus there are new beginnings. A new beginning for each person individually, but there is also a new beginning for us as a community. Every person has a place of belonging in the body of Christ. Every person has a place of value in the body of Christ. As the body of Christ, our testimony needs to be one that shares that good news of great joy for all people. Let's pray. Father, forgive us for the times that we have treated others as unlovable and too far removed from your grace and mercy. Teach us how to walk alongside and bring the outsider back into a place of belonging. We are grateful for the new beginning you have extended to each of us individually. Challenge us to allow that new beginning to influence us as a community. Help us to reflect you in all we say and do in and outside this place, your place. In Jesus' name, amen.